a lot, Brian. So, yes, mm. my name is Ella Iwaszkiewicz Egebrecht. Um, <laughs> that's, that's what I said. <laughs> exactly, like Brian said. Um, yeah, I'm thrilled to be here today uh, presenting, showing you uh, what we've learned. I've been with uh, a postdoc in the Insect Biome Atlas project in Stockholm since late 2019. And as uh, uh, Frederick gave us the estimate that processing all the thousands of samples will take 20 days, well, it took us a while longer because we had to figure out what to do, <laughs> how to make sense of, of, yeah, of this insect, insect soup. Uh, maybe I will pass around the bottle so you can all take a look and feel feeling what we are dealing with. So this is a picture from Freezer, Freezer House in Sweden, where we have a collection of our Swedish and Malagasy samples. And uh, yes, learning from the Swedish Malaysia projects, we know that uh, looking at every insect and identifying it is just, it's just extremely time consuming. It's just not possible. And we wanted to implement a genetic methods to identify insects, but how exactly to do it? Um, well, there, there was no like clue, um, uh, clear method, and we've spent a lot of time and effort working on this. Uh, we have now optimized protocol that should, in principle, allow us to process it very fast and very effectively. Uh, it's reliable, it's reproducible, it's cost-effective, and yes, we are happy to, to share it and implement it in different places. So, to give a little bit of background, um, I want to introduce you to the DNA barcoding. So, uh, all life, uh, as we know it, uh, has genetic, same genetic code, and we, can, and we know how to sequence it. And we also have uh, this uh, one specific part of the genome, the CO1 gene, that serves as a sort of a barcode for all life. Uh, it, has a, it has been um, used widely and we have a large database that we can compare those barcodes to and basically by sequencing this short fragment we can very effectively um, de decipher what species this DNA comes from and identify all different insects. Uh, so what we do, um, in, in short, with metabarcoding is that we extract DNA from the whole uh, community of insects, the whole bottle of insects. We amplify the short barcode fragment of DNA, sequence it, and then we can assign uh, each barcode uh, to a specific uh, insect species. This is the overview of our protocol. I will walk you through uh, different steps, but here I wanted to give you the overview and to show the principle that we start with one such a Malay strap catch bottle. We perform mild lysis, which means that we, we put a special lysis buffer in where insects incubate for a number, for a number of hours. They release a little bit of DNA into this lysis buffer, sort of a spa bath water. And then we extract DNA from this, from this spa bath water, leaving insects basically intact. So at the end, we can take uh, the ethanol that we've taken out, we can pour it back into the sample, and we preserve those samples in the freezer house where future researchers um, can access the material and actually look at the insects, uh, describe species, or perform uh, further molecular work. So this is, this is a very important aspect uh, of our analysis. With the spa bath water, sort of the lysis, we uh, amplify uh, barcodes, sequence them, uh, and then learn what species we had in the sample. So just a few snapshots from our, what happens to the samples, how we, how we get to, uh, to the species lists. This is uh, how the lab looks like in Sweden, where we process the samples. We have very clearly uh, divided sections for each sample. 
the insects never leave the malestra bottle, so we avoid all sorts of possible contaminations. We take, uh, we take a lot of care of it. You see there are forceps for each sample separately. It's uh, fairly clean. What you see here in the picture is the counting of the ethanol. So samples, insects are preserved in ethanol. We, uh, we pour the ethanol out, measure ethanol concentration to make sure that the sample was well preserved. And uh, uh, we proceed, oh. and we proceed to the wet weighing. So each sample uh, after the ethanol evaporated a little bit is, uh, is weighed in a, it's very precise on a precise scale, and this data serves what Laura was presenting before, the biomass uh, estimates for uh, insect communities. We assign each sample to a size class, and based on this uh, biomass we can add appropriate amount of lysis buffer so that we will have a nice DNA concentrations at the end. Uh, we put uh, this lysis buffer in and incubate them in 56 degrees for three hours in a shaking incubator. And afterwards we pour, again, we pour out the ethanol. There's a mesh here that you maybe don't really see on the picture, but there's a very fine mesh that doesn't allow any insects to flow through. We only collect the spa bath water. Um, and all the slices, slices that we collected are also QR uh, coded and stored in a freezer house. We use only a small aliquot of the buffer, two milliliters, that go to the DNA lab, where we store the whole collection of slices uh, in our freezers. We use a tiny bit of it for DNA extraction. To speed things up, uh, we use robots to purify DNA, and then the uh, extracted DNA we divide into two, uh, two batches, the working stock that we sequence afterwards, and the long-term storage, which is also QR coded. Each of those tubes has its own individual QR code, and this is a collection of DNA that is also accessible to researchers. With the working stock DNA, we perform a two-step uh, PCR library preparation, pulling all the samples together, and we sequence them on Illumina platform. What we receive as a result of the sequencing is just uh, hundreds of thousands of barcode variants of different genetic variants that we detected in our samples. They have just very cryptic names. It's a super long also a sort of a code that identifies them. And then we group those barcodes uh, based on the genetic similarity. So sequences that are very similar to each other are grouped into one sort of OTU, operational taxonomic unit. This is, this is a term that we will be using also uh, in the next presentation Rob will be talking about. So I really want you to <laughs> understand what we are talking about. All those sequences that were very similar to one another become our one taxonomic unit. Uh, sometimes it's just a single, uh, single, might be a single sequence that's just very different from anything else. It becomes its own operational taxonomic unit. Then we look at those different operational taxonomic units and match them to the reference uh, library publicly available collection of barcodes uh, with, that are matched with identified species. So if we look, we, uh, we just compare our sequence to the reference library, and then we can say that the OTU number one was uh, this beautiful moth, for instance. This is, this, uh, this is what the sequence was coming from. The second OTU, also perfect match between 98 and 100% similarity to this um, plain tiger butterfly. Fantastic. Also for some, um, for flower spike part, we can also say that this, uh, this sequence was coming from this organism. And that's brilliant. This is, this is how we get our species lists. 
However, what also happens very often is that we have sequences, operational taxonomic units that match to something, but we don't know what that exactly is. For instance, we know that it's an ant, probably from a genus Camponotus, but we do not have a sequence for this particular species in the reference library. We don't have it yet. <laughs> so it's a... Um, so we can only assign it to a certain taxon taxonomic level. A different OTU, we know it's a cockroach, and we basically don't know mu m much more. We don't know what family, what genus, what species it comes from. So these are those gaps in the reference library that we are dealing with. And in Sweden, how uh, to reiterate what Frederick was talking about, the reference library is fairly complete. We share... Um, species in Sweden we share with all Europe, basically. Uh, so there is a lot of effort for many years been in completing this re those reference libraries. In Madagascar, of course, situation is very different. The fauna is very um, specific, different, and, um, and just isolated from the rest of the world. So it really, the effort needs to happen here to complete such reference library. And with this, I want to say thank you. <laughs>